Hi, this is Colin McEnroe. You're getting ready to hear another episode, episode eight, if you want to be technical, of Pardon Me, Another Damn Impeachment Show. We have Dahlia Lithwick, one of the foremost Supreme Court observers in the United States, joining us. Also, law professor Lara Bazelon. There's going to be factoids with Kyone Wolf, which is almost now a trademarkable hit. And we'll also talk to a Washington Post reporter that we know well who unearthed a song, a song from the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. So all of that, plus questions and answers and loads of fun right after the proverbial this. Because President Trump pressured a foreign government to target an American citizen for political and personal gain. Lawyer lawsuits? We're talking about the impeachment of a president of the United States, duly elected. And the members, the managers, are complaining about lawyer lawsuits? I think it is appropriate at this point for me to admonish both the House managers and the president's counsel in equal terms to remember that they are addressing the world's greatest deliberative body. We are here, sir, because President Trump solicited foreign interference in the 2020 election and corrupted our democracy. In the 1905 Swain trial, a senator objected when one of the managers used the word pettifogging and the presiding officer said the word ought not to have been used. We are here, sir, because President Trump corruptly abused his power and then he tried to cover it up. I thought our team did a very good job, but honestly, we have all the material. They don't have the material. Shortly after 5.30 p.m., Senator James Risch, the Republican of Idaho, could be seen motionless, eyes closed, and head slumping against his right hand. Risch was the first lawmaker seen by Washington Post reporters to have clearly fallen asleep. And we are here, sir, to follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the truth to the American people. And if you don't know, now you know. All right. That was our uh, uh, Jonathan McNichol produced intro for this week. And that was Hakeem Jeffries, one of the House managers, quoting the notorious B.I.G. Also, Senator Risch said he didn't really fall asleep. And also he had a really big lunch and then it was really warm in the room. So, you know, there's something bad has happened here. This is Colin McEnroe, by the way, and you're listening to, pardon me, another damn impeachment show. And I should first of all tell you that when we first Im- imagined this show, we thought it would be, you know, it would be a podcast, but it would also be at noon on Saturdays. And the triumph was going to be when the trial started and it was going to start at one o'clock every day. We just knew that from previous practice. So we'd go on the air at noon, do a show for an hour, and then the trial would start on. This would be our Saturday plan. And now we can't even tell what they're doing, but they're not going to do that. All right. So I have no idea when you're going to hear this show, but you will hear it. It'll definitely be on Sunday. At, I don't know. Why am I telling you when you can hear this show? You're listening to it already. Uh, Uh, Anyway, uh, there's all of that. I think now, unless something comes to crowd it out, the symbol of this impeachment trial is going to be the fidget spinner. You know, these are these stupid toys that at least three of the senators who are supposed to be sitting as jurors in a solemn impeachment, one of the most historic things the Senate could possibly do. But they are bored. (laughs) So they have fidget spinners like they're six years old. I mean, this is this is an idiocracy. All right. This is all you need to know about this impeachment and how not seriously Republican senators are taking it is that rather than pay attention, they have fidget spinners. We have a really good show for you. We've got terrific guests. You're going to meet all of them one by one as we go. So let's get right into that right now.
when we first even envisioned this idea of a new show, Dahlia Lithwick was the first name I thought of. She writes about the courts and the law for Slate, and she hosts the podcast Amicus, where they've been covering these questions. They also have coming up some specials, Amicus Election Meltdown Story Arc, Amicus The Age of Ultron, uh, <laughs> Amicus Fire Walk With Me. There's live Amicus, too, right? You can, we have an audience and stuff? Yes, we are going to have a live show in D.C. next month, and Tickets are selling like the proverbial amicus hotcakes. So, All right. yeah, it'll be fun. All right. So I want to talk about something that I've been geeking out about in kind of a Lithwickian manner. I mean, it's sort of the Senate that's not the Senate, and it's a trial that's not a trial. Let's start with that first one. There is some almost metaphysical sense in which the Senate has been decomposed and recomposed, right? That basically they've stopped exactly being senators the way senators are senators and start being kind of almost para jurors or something. Yeah, I mean, this is such a meta way to start this, mm-hmm. but I think that that's exactly right. It looks like the Senate, it quacks like the Senate, except the senators aren't speaking, they're not voting, they're just sitting. And they are meant to be jurors, but they're not exactly jurors. And they're meant to be the judge, but they're not exactly the judge. So it is definitely this strange interstitial Senate-like thing, except because it's imported sort of some of the trappings of a trial. It's a trial-like Senate thing, but then those trappings of the trial, as you say, are also falling away. So, and maybe... The best way to capture your super meta point in a concrete way is to say we don't have C-SPAN cameras. We don't have TV cameras. What we have is the kind of in-house camera that really limits what the public can see. So we're not even seeing the Senate qua Senate. We're seeing what the Senate wants us to see of the Senate, which is actually profoundly different. Right. And actually, speaking of that camera, I should have mentioned right at the top that you're still a little bit breathless and unsettled by seeing John Roberts' legs. Not that there's anything special or exciting about John Roberts' legs. It's sort of like Oscar the Grouch, like, you know, what else is there besides that little part of him that we see? You don't, you've been covering the Supreme Court forever. You've never seen his legs before. Yeah, I mean, for me, I I think I said this on the podcast, it was so weird to see him stride across the Senate well and take his chair because I've only ever seen him really sitting almost static behind the bench at the Supreme Court. And, you know, the larger point is for somebody who has spent 15 years keeping the cameras turned off at the Supreme Court, it's so fundamentally weird to see the camera trained on him hours and hours and hours at a time because he's not used to cameras any more than I am used to seeing him on a camera. So that's itself like a deeply weird kind of public capture of something that we never, ever see. So I want to go back to this question, because as I understand it, for example, under what happens, which is this decomposition followed by the swearing in of the senators under a new oath, a different oath than the one that they take when they become U.S. senators. As I understand it, for example, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer, even though all motions now come through them, they really don't have any special office anymore. This is 100 men and women who are sitting hearing this trial. And some questions have been raised about this oath. And scholars like Lawrence Lessig have even suggested that to whatever extent people like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham have talked about what they plan to do and how they view all this and whether they're coordinating with the White House, that they're in violation of a sworn oath. Lessig or somebody suggested that Schumer or somebody should make a motion about that, saying something vaguely resembling perjury is happening here, so to speak, is very different from what they've told the press they're going to do. It's kind of been a creeping problem, Colin, over the days. You know, we have what we can all agree is a funny political trial, but nonetheless a trial. And it starts with oaths, as you say, and these are sworn oaths. And we watch the senators take it and we watch them sign the little book. And yet even going into the trial, we had several senators crowing, including Mitch McConnell, like, dude, I don't have an open mind. I'm not going to sit here and assess the evidence. So already we have a sense that you're about to swear an oath that you're going to listen impartially, and yet you've already claimed that you're in violation of that oath. And you're quite right. There were a lot of scholars on both sides of the aisle who took that quite seriously. And then 
It's sort of compounded by one of the things that they are sworn to do is remain in the chamber. And yet over the course of the day on Thursday, I mean, there were moments where there were 20 senators who just were not in the room. Folks are ducking out into the cloakroom and making phone calls, disappearing for an hour to do television. So they've sort of claimed that they're going to listen impartially to all the evidence of them overtly not doing that. Now there's questions being raised about whether someone should make a motion to John Roberts to sanction people who are simply not showing up because they're supposed to be doing that. And I think layered over that, it's also worth saying this trial that is not a trial will now seemingly not include witnesses or any evidence. So yes, it is deconstructing itself as something that's even a trial light. And you can certainly query what it is that we're doing there if no oaths matter, no evidence, no witnesses. The jurors are just ambling around the cloakroom, <laughs> not attending. Some of them are doing crosswords. And it really does raise the question sort of how many legs can you kick out from under this table and still have anything that purports to be any kind of trying of fact. I would add to this that uh, they have been nice enough not to mention the fact that one of their membership, Ron Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin, is, as far as I can tell, something between a material witness and a co-conspirator with some of the fact patterns that are being brought forth in the trial. Because of his committee position, he was in the room with Gordon Sondland and other House witnesses when Trump was talking about Ukraine (laughs) policy. I mean, he has been around while a lot of the things that are alleged to have happened were happening. He would be, I think, a material witness in a typical trial. So to have him sit on the jury is like having Kato Kalin and A.J. Cowing sitting on the O.J. jury. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. But that's sort of the point, right, that it doesn't apparently have to make any sense. It's a jury that does nothing, as you're saying, that a jury would typically do. And add to that, I think there were motions on the first morning that Pat Cipollone, who is White House counsel wearing one hat, but he is Donald Trump's defense attorney uh, wearing another. He also is a material, not just witness, but participant in the claims about obstruction of Congress, right? The second article of impeachment is that we've seen unprecedented obstruction and no attempt to accommodate Congress's demands for oversight in any way. Those letters were coming from the pen of Pat Cipollone. So it, it's very weird. You know, there are people who should be recused for various conflicts, but are not. And I think it does go to this larger question that you started with, which is, I think the play was always to make it look as much like a trial as possible and have that bricked in all around by no witnesses, no evidence, no testimony, no real jurors, no oaths, no cameras. You know, we're just going to have day by day this deconstruction of even the basic elements of a trial. And then the hope is that I guess it looked enough like a trial that folks were mollified or at minimum that, you know, Republican senators in purple states can say, felt like a trial to me and move on. But I think that there is this question, you know, hovering over all of it, I guess 71 percent of Americans, the Pew poll suggests now, wanted to see witnesses and testimony. So the real question then becomes, is this going to be enough to mollify an American public who I think with each passing day is sort of scratching their heads, asking the questions you're asking? And another thing that's being relitigated is something that I, something you and I talked about months and months and months ago, and I just kind of regarded it as a settled matter, which is whether or not impeachment charges have to map directly onto criminal statutes, whether uh, one, in order to be impeached and convicted, needs to have committed an actual discernible, palpable crime that would be adjudicable in a typical criminal court. And in this sort of strange quantum and environment that we live in. We, of course, encounter Alan Dershowitz, who at various times has believed both things. Let's start with him talking to George Stephanopoulos on ABC's This Week. 
Well, it's the same position that was successfully argued by former Justice Benjamin Curtis in the trial of Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson was impeached in part for non-criminal conduct. And when you read the text of the Constitution, bribery, um, treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors, other really means that crimes and misdemeanors must be of akin to treason and bribery. And he argued very successfully, winning the case, that you needed proof of of an actual crime. It needn't be a statutory crime, but it has to be criminal behavior, criminal in nature. And then let's listen to Alan Dershowitz, the same, we believe the same Alan Dershowitz in 1998 uh, during the Clinton impeachment trial. Here's what he sounded like then. It certainly doesn't have to be a crime. If you have somebody who completely corrupts the office of president and who abuses trust and who poses great danger to our liberty, you don't need a technical crime. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the problems with reviving people like Dershowitz and Starr, who participated in the Clinton trial, is they're essentially obligated to contravene what they said the first time because they're going in a different direction now. I thought, you know, this notion had been laid to rest, and here it is again. You know, it's interesting. I think that the pundits have said, not incorrectly, that it's no accident that Donald Trump's principal constitutional lawyer on this point is actually a criminal lawyer, right? Like Alan Dershowitz is first and foremost a criminal attorney and the idea that he is sort of declaiming on what the framers thought that abuse of power might look like when they drafted the Constitution goes to the fact that they couldn't find a constitutional lawyer to make that argument. Even Jonathan Turley who was one of the Republican witnesses before the House, who was the constitutional scholar that the Republicans brought in, was at pains to say, of course, abuse of power is enough. It doesn't need to be a criminal violation. There was no federal criminal code at the founding, so it would have made no sense. And so this is an argument, I mean, it's not just that he's kind of impeaching himself because there's testimony to the contrary that you've just played, but it's also that I don't think there are a whole lot of constitutional law scholars who think that what the framers intended was to limit themselves to some actual crime. And in fact, there's heaps and heaps and heaps of evidence from the founders that this is exactly the kind of thing they worried about. It didn't need to be a criminal use of presidential power for corrupt motives, particularly when it involves foreign influence. But that is exactly what the framers were worried about. And so I think you're quite right. This was kind of to some extent litigated in the House when even the GOP witness said, of course, it doesn't need to be a crime. It could be abuse of power. It's being invoked now, I think, to make the sort of point that the only defense that the president has, in some sense, they have him dead to rights on the actions, right? There's not a lot of defense that this didn't happen anymore. We've got multiple witnesses showing that it did. And so the two defenses tend to be yeah, I did it, but everyone does it, and it's cool and legal, and it was a perfect phone call. Or alternatively, this kind of, no, 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 we mean to reverse engineer the framers' language when they chose what was going to be impeachable offense, that it could only be high crimes and misdemeanors, that could only be violations of criminal statutes. And there's just not a ton of evidence to show that that's the case. Yeah, you know, and I think even any easy thought experiment would help anybody out. I mean, imagine Imagine a president who simply didn't do the job or imagine a president who became openly anti-Semitic, you know, and started denying the Holocaust and checking the ethnicities of his ambassadors and purging any who were Jewish. You have to have a mechanism to get rid of that person. That's right. And I think, you know, you can go back and look. I think it's Noah Feldman that has a good piece in Bloomberg saying that if you look at the British All of the British history of impeachment is removing people for the kinds of things you're describing. I think the technical word was maladministration, you know, just being kind of like a crap uh, (laughs) executive. The benchmark is, are you corrupt? Are you using your power corruptly? Are you using, you know, your executive office to advance 
personal agendas. That's all under this broad bucket of the kinds of things that the British were impeaching. What I wonder here, and I don't know whether it's within the purview of even Dahlia Lithwick to address this, but who else can I talk to about it? It almost does seem like the idiocracy version of impeachment, right? I mean, it just feels like, you know, if your colleague David Platz was here, you know, one thing that he says a lot is these processes are essentially broken now. They don't work. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a couple of things. I think one is there's just a basic causation fallacy here, which is to say you can't really stomp around all due respect to Jay Sekulow and to Pat Cipollone and say, y'all should have done this in the House. You know, you're Mm -hmm. just lazy and stupid. You didn't call witnesses. You didn't get evidence. You screwed up. It's not on us to do your homework without at least somewhere in your brain connecting to that to the fact that there was no way (laughs) to get anything done in the House because there was blanket obstruction of any attempt to do anything in the House. And we've never seen anything like that. You know, obviously, there's been throughout the history of impeachment, the coordinate branches are working together to accommodate those kinds of requests. So this is the first time where we get the White House counsel saying, nope, nobody can talk. We're just not participating. And then to turn around and say, hey, you should have done this. And it's certainly not happening here in the Senate. It requires a sort of willful blindness about what caused us to be here. And I think people are checked out. They don't know if you're only turning on your TV this week. You're probably scratching your head and saying like, hey, Pat Cipollone is right. Why didn't they subpoena John Bolton in the House? They must be lazy and stupid. And so I think there is a little bit of banking on the fact that the public doesn't know kind of how we got here. And then I think there's this much scarier thing that I'm trying to think through, and I don't have anyone else to talk to, so I'll ask you about it, (laughs) which is, you know, the new Pew polling that says that, what is it, 63% of Americans believe that Donald Trump committed crimes in office, and a massive number of them don't care. You know, the play has always been whenever this administration is caught doing anything, they initially deny they did it. And then they say, yeah, I did it. And it's fine. And I think that we might be witnessing this very, very scary sort of race to the bottom in terms of what is criminal conduct, right? The GAO just announced, no, this really broke the law. It's really bad withholding the aid money. Mm -hmm. It's not even a question anymore. And yet, If the vast majority of Americans both think that the president committed crimes in office and think that it just doesn't matter, then it's not just idiocracy. We're like full on nihilism. It's that we've made a decision that the president does not have to adhere to the law. And that's what's worrying me a little bit today. One of the pieces that really made my jaw drop just kind of in recognition was Jonathan Mahler's piece on Rudy Giuliani in the New York Times magazine recently, where it really became a piece not so much about Giuliani, but about a climate of shamelessness, where rather than trying to conceal things of which you probably should be ashamed, you talk about them frankly and just kind of, it's not even altering the Overton window anymore. It's really altering fundamental mores that underpin society things that if you did them, you should have hidden in the past. You would have hidden in the past. You parade them around right now because you believe there are no consequences. And if that's the case, I think what we're both saying is this isn't really probably addressable by political or judicial institutions. It's a different kind of conversation we'd have to have if we're going to reinstitute shame in our society. Well, the only place I might balk, I mean, I will out despondent you any day of the week, but the thing I might balk at us. I do actually think that judicial institutions can still be a bulwark here. In other words, I think we're in complete agreement that what we're seeing this week is sort of defining misconduct down, right? So, you know, it's fine. This, while Donald Trump is being impeached in the House, Rudy Giuliani, who's holding himself out both as somehow a State Department lawyer and as Donald Trump's personal lawyer and somehow in charge of international diplomacy is swanning around Ukraine, like colluding to try to do the very thing, right, to dig up dirt on the Bidens that the president is being impeached for. So clearly we have no capacity to, like, look around and ask ourselves, huh, you know, why is Rudy Giuliani allowed to do this? Why is Bill Barr allowed to, like, fly around to Italy and Australia to collect dirt? This seems wrong. So there's that, and I agree with you that that's disappearing. I do think that court after court after court 
has been checking this administration, not as fast as we want, not in every instant. But I think that it's useful to at least differentiate, if we could, just for our sanity, between a public willingness and even sometimes a media willingness to sort of meet the criminality where it is and say, eh, maybe it's not that bad. And the courts, which I think have stood up to this pretty adeptly in the last few years. And so I think maybe I would just try to separate, I think, a growing public and political acceptance. And we can carbon date this back to Merrick Garland. Old norms are gone. And if you have power, you do it. And Russia, if you're listening, and this administration simply not turning over documents, they're meant to, you know, the Jared Kushner memos not being turned over to a district judge. You know, we're seeing Boston judge who says, don't deport a guy. The guy's deported. So we're seeing law breaking. But I think that the courts at least have tried their level best to hold the line. That, of course, was Dahlia Lithwick, who writes about the courts and the law for Slate. She hosts their Amicus podcast. Next up, we've got Kyone Wolf with a little thing we call factoids. In the impeachment trial, Bill Clinton, three witnesses were called. Monica Lewinsky, Sidney Blumenthal, and Vernon Jordan. The Senate was wary of live testimony from Lewinsky, so all three witnesses were deposed in other locations and the Senate watched videotapes. Giuliani associate Lev Parnas started a company called Fraud Guarantee, partly as a way to suppress Google results, directing searchers to earlier fraud allegations against him, according to the Wall Street Journal. The journal said Fraud Guarantee, in six years, had attracted no apparent customers, generated no investor profits, and had defaulted on its lease. Senators can only drink water and milk in the Senate chamber. This is the case at all times, not just impeachment trials. It just seems worse because the senators cannot leave as easily. The original rule was water only, but in 1966, Everett Dirksen, the colorful Republican senator from Illinois, formally announced that he very much needed a glass of milk. The rules were changed. There are at least nine Twitter accounts purporting to be authored by Ted Cruz's beard. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court John Roberts will turn 65 on Monday. No word on whether there will be an impeachment cake. Clowns, of course, are always a possibility. Electronic devices such as phones and laptops are banned from the chamber, but at least seven senators were spotted wearing Apple Watches, which can be used to transmit and receive information. In 2017, the Boston Red Sox used Apple Watches to steal signs from other teams. Trump lawyer Jay Sekulow has a rock band. It's called the Jay Sekulow Band. And here's what it sounds like. I am so sorry you had to hear that. I'm Kyone Wolf, and this has been Factoids. After this break, we'll talk to Lara Bazelon, part of the Flying Bazelons. It's like a circus act, except they're all lawyers. Uh, and later in the show, we'll introduce you to the impeachment hoka.
Welcome back. This is Pardon Me. I'm Colin McEnroe. This is a weekly show we do for as long as the quote-unquote impeachment season lasts. Thanks for joining us. Anyway, we've got an impeachment question from a listener and a friend of the show, Rebecca Castellani, and we've got that question answered by Bruce Ackerman, the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale, because we're not asking some guy at the counter at Midas Muffler these questions. We're getting Bruce Ackerman kind of people. Can Trump appeal if he's convicted? If so, would that go to the Supreme Court? Uh, No, but one should notice that there are two issues that the Senate at the end of the trial will resolve. The first one is whether President Trump should be removed from office. You need two-thirds vote on that. But if the answer were yes, then... The Senate would vote on a second question, which is, should President Trump, uh, or for ex-President Trump, be barred from future offices? And you need a majority on that. So it's conceivable, analytically at least, that President Trump could be removed from office, but permitted to continue running for for election in 2020. <laughs> All right. That's that's a scary one. Uh, that's right. Well, but I'm just trying, you know, I'm just trying to answer your question. <laughs> All right. So send your other questions if you're out there listening to pardon me at ctpublic.org, and we will get esteemed legal scholars like Bruce Ackerman to answer them for you. Thanks for doing this, sir. Oh, pleasure. I don't want to make too big a deal of this, but this is the second member of the Bazelon family who has appeared here on Pardon Me, another damn impeachment show. Emily Bazelon was on one of our first shows. But now we're moving up through the ranks. And we've got Lara Bazelon, a professor of law at the University of San Francisco School of Law, contributor to Slate and Politico magazine, and the author of Rectify, The Power of Restorative Justice After Wrongful Conviction. She recently wrote an op-ed for The Washington Post, arguing basically that the seven House managers should understand who their true audience is and try to make a case to that audience as quickly as possible. First of all, welcome to our show. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. You know, reading the piece now, I sort of feel like the House managers might have read this piece and said, hmm, you know, she's got an interesting point here. Before we explore that question, let's begin by having you lay out your thesis. What I believe is that the acquittal of Donald Trump by the Senate is a foregone conclusion because it's essentially mathematically impossible to get two thirds of the senators to convict since the majority are Republicans. And that's just political suicide for them. So if you take that as your premise, the next question is, well, what's the point of this whole exercise, other than, of course, to try to hold the president to account. And to me, the point is to make the argument to the sliver of the American public who matters. And by that, I mean the folks who live in swing states who are undecided, that he is corrupt and needs to be removed. And so the ultimate verdict will really be rendered in 2020. You, from there, get a little bit more granular and talk about very specific things that might happen. So this is kind of all written in in advance of what has happened. It does seem to me that Adam Schiff and company, in terms of the way that they've laid out the case, for the most part, I think that they are talking to a much vaster audience and are making a case that the general public could conceivably absorb. But maybe you don't feel that way. How do you think they're doing so far? I tend to agree with you. I think that Adam Schiff really laid out the case in a pretty compelling manner, especially given that he's hamstrung by the fact that this really isn't made for TV, given that it's these Senate cameras and they're not allowing regular television and cable news shots, which would involve close-ups and different angles. And instead, it's just very dull to look at. But I think what people have been able to excerpt and post online about his arguments have resonated. And in particular, he had this moment where he's kind of making the legal case and he looks up and says, in other words, he cheated or he cheats. And I think that was just an example of a prosecutor looking away from the senators who are watching and really looking directly into a camera that he thinks is the place where the American people are watching. You know, another moment that I think maps pretty well onto your original argument, and it's been controversial, was Nadler up there saying, you know, if you're not going to pursue new evidence, if you're not going to call witnesses who have material knowledge, you're participating in a cover-up. And 
it seems to be the reason for Roberts's admonishment too. On the other hand, using a term like that and having it get repeated and repeated in the media might in fact serve Nadler's purpose. Right. I mean, I think there's two things going on. I think trial 101 says that the most reasonable person in the room in terms of prosecution versus defense is usually the person who's the most believable. And by reasonable, I don't mean boring. I just mean not using very inflammatory rhetoric the way that Nadler did. But again, I don't think that Nadler's audience really is Justice Roberts or his Republican colleagues. He's trying to make the bigger case that you're making, which is that that phrase, complicity, and conspiracy to cover up and this idea that the senators are guilty of that in some way will resonate more broadly. And I think that's the gamble that he's making. And we'll have to see how that plays itself out. I think the kind of thing that you're talking about also is reflected a little bit in the selection of the respective teams. So on the one hand, President Trump preferred, first of all, white men, but also preferred people who've been on television a lot, people he'd seen on Fox making arguments on his behalf. That's kind of the ultimate test of valor as far as he's concerned. Nancy Pelosi and whoever she consulted with picked a team a little bit more representative of America, maybe a a little bit more apt be able to speak to various constituencies who might be watching. Let's hear one member of that team, Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York. We are here, sir, because President Trump pressured a foreign government to target an American citizen for political and personal gain. We are here, sir, because President Trump solicited foreign interference in the 2020 election and corrupted our democracy. We are here, sir, because President Trump withheld $391 million in military aid from a vulnerable Ukraine without justification in a manner that has been deemed unlawful. We are here, sir, because President Donald Trump elevated his personal political interests and subordinated the national security interests of the United States of America. We are here, sir, because President Trump corruptly abused his power and then he tried to cover it up. And we are here, sir, to follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the truth to the American people. That is why we are here, Mr. Seculo. And if you don't know, now you know. Jeffries now is very, very much talking to one segment of America and talking in a particular vocabulary that might be meaningful to them. I agree. And he's also doing something that's very effective, which is repetition. He keeps Mm. saying, we are here, sir. And it's his anchoring phrase. And then he closes by concluding, and that's why we are here. And it tends to be really effective with jurors when you have a sort of phrase that you repeat almost like an incantation and it's a way to hold their attention in between the points that you're making. You're looping back to that phrase that has caught their attention in the first place. So I think it was just a really good use of rhetoric. Yeah, they've been very clever that way. Um, The other day, Adam Schiff began a, a series of repetitions like that that were preceded by, you may ask yourself, and you may ask yourself, And you may ask yourself, and a certain segment of the audience immediately started thinking about David Byrne and the talking heads because that actually... I definitely did. (laughs) (laughs) You may ask yourself, what is that beautiful house? You may ask yourself, where does that highway go to? And you may ask yourself, am I right? Am I wrong? And you may say to yourself, my God, what have I done? So, I mean, it was a good rhetorical device, even if you've never heard that song. But if you heard that song, and there's something a little David Byrne-ish about Adam Schiff anyway, that it was uh, and and a special kind of ring to it. We should just talk very quickly. I mean, this is also a very political conversation. So as we kind of look at public opinion on it, you know, you can see that it's like 54 to 41 in favor of removal as opposed to acquittal. And then they're even pulling on the question of should new witnesses be allowed? That seems to be increasingly a polarized question between Republicans and Democrats. But the unaffiliated, which is probably the group in your argument, they should care the most about swing voters 
are at about 60% saying, yes, we would be interested in seeing new witnesses. It seems as though maybe the Trump defense team so far, they start with an audience of one, right? They work for Donald Trump. He's watching. They've got to do stuff that will not displease him. I wonder how much they can manage to think about what is kind of an unpersuaded group of Americans who may politically need to be persuaded that the right things are happening. That's a great point. I mean, I think if there are no witnesses called and no documents, what exactly are these 100 senators evaluating other than a bunch of arguments? And so then I think if that happens, the challenge for Trump's attorneys is to make the case to enough swing voters that this whole thing is such a sham. And also, I think their fallback is, even if true, not rising to the level of impeachable offense. And so therefore, no one should be that concerned that essentially the trial was dispensed with. And I think that does pose something of a challenge for them. Right. I mean, I think in each case, there's the distinction between talking to the persuaded versus talking to the persuadable. Your point is, what do people think who are persuadable? In some ways, Lara, that may be something we can't know. I think we can't know for sure. But one thing that remains true about most Americans is they don't like unfairness. And they're very, very familiar, thanks to television and movies, with trials. And they know that trials involve witnesses and evidence. And so they've been told this is going to be a trial. And I think for those persuadable folks, if it's not a trial at all, they are not probably going to take that well to it. And as you say, you see that reflected in the polls and that crucial segment, the independents, by a pretty clear majority, want to hear more. And that pressure is going to exert itself on people like Susan Collins, who's up for re-election, Cory Gardner up for re-election, Lisa Murkowski, Lamar Alexander, folks who either have reputational concerns or pride themselves as being centrist or have real political peril that they're facing if they don't allow more information to come out. And what's kind of ironic, of course, is that a hundred people could testify, and you're absolutely right, that it's not going to change the minds of the vast majority of people, including Trump's base and the people who can't stand Trump. But it will almost certainly, I think, influence a critical segment of voters who are going to come out in 2020. There's another component to that, and that's exhaustion. We had John Harris from Politico on the show recently. He was talking about running into Bob Schrum, the famous Democratic political consultant uh, out at the debates in L.A. recently, and Schrum talking about how at the end of the Clinton years, he had a lot of polling that just showed that people were tired. They were exhausted from the drama of the Clinton story. And even though Clinton's approval ratings were relatively high, even though he probably could have won re-election to a third term if that were permitted. There was another way in which there was a kind of psychic exhaustion. People don't want their government to be tiring. People don't want their government to be this circus-like spectacle that's kind of exhausting to behold. And there's a way in which the person who contributes least to that feeling may extract a slight victory from all this. I agree with what you're saying. And I think it also gets get back to that fundamental point of the most reasonable person in the room is usually the person <laughs> who has the most credibility and ends up prevailing in the end. Okay, that was Lara Bazelon, professor of law at the University of San Francisco School of Law, sister of regular guest Emily Bazelon. Next week, we're going to have Zeppo Bazelon. Not a lawyer, kind of angry, but worth talking to. One of the things we are committed to doing here on Pardon Me, Another Damn Impeachment Show, is looking at the cultural side, cultural responses to this impeachment and other impeachments. And so we know that historically, well, we found out that historically, certainly one very talented songwriter wrote a song about impeachment. And here's what it sounded like. No, no, no. We don't have Neil Young on this show. There's no Neil Young on this show. And that's not the song we're talking about either. The song we're talking about actually comes from an earlier <laughs> an earlier impeachment, the, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Joining us now is uh, someone who we've had 
This is his first music savant appearance on our show, but he's been in here in other capacities. Philip Bump is a correspondent for The Washington Post based in New York, and he's joining us via the miracle that is Skype. And so, in fact, it is not the Neil Young song, Philip Bump, that has attracted your attention. It is a song from 1868. Tell us about it. So, 1868, Andrew Johnson has taken over the presidency for the assassinated Abraham Lincoln. He is extremely unpopular and has gotten into some fights with Congress. Congress, in particular focused on Johnson's predilection for firing members of his cabinet. Congress passes a law that makes it harder for him to do that. Johnson promptly tries to fire the Secretary of War, and he faces impeachment. I spoke with an historian who's written a book about that impeachment, and she noted that that impeachment was the first in American history, very quickly became a huge cultural phenomenon. The newspapers were putting out extra editions. Walt Whitman told his mother that he was going to go and sit in on the impeachment within the Capitol itself. All of these people were very attuned to what was happening. At the same time, there was a new shift in how music spread across the country. People were starting to own pianos. Middle class and upper class homes had pianos. Obviously, there were no recordings. Our phonograph hadn't been invented yet. And so what people would do is they would buy sheet music and perform it in their homes or in music halls. And this became a big business. So what happened is that an enterprising musician and or an enterprising publisher got together and they said, hey, let's come up with a piece of music that is focused on this impeachment. And so Charles Dupie Blake, who was a very, very prolific songwriter in that time, wrote something that is now known as the impeachment polka. And let's hear the impeachment. You, when you hear this, you're going to see it just screams impeachment. Here, here we go. <laughs> say that he, this composer, as you point out, Philip Bump is, is very prolific. He wrote My Humps with the eventual Black Eyed Peas hit. Um, no, he didn't do that. Although, and I just dis- I did some extra research and I discovered that we could easily do a 20 minute segment on our show about who wrote Rockabye Baby. But right. he is one of the songwriters to whom I think somewhat implausibly Rockabye Baby is attributed. Yeah, that's right. So he actually was prolific and well-known enough that he earned a mention on his death in obituary in the New York Times. The New York Times credited Rockabye Baby to him. You're right that that seems a little hard to believe. Perhaps there was a particularly popular arrangement uh, that he had put his name to. Uh, But it does really explain why he would be someone who would sort of latch on to this cultural moment to put out a piece of music, since he was someone who put out a lot of things. And, you know, there's this publisher in Boston, which is where Blake lived. One of went to the other and said, hey, this is an opportunity for us to make money. And, you know, they pumped out the sheet music, 30 cents a pop. And, you know, it's obviously hard to say how much money they, they actually made, but it seems pretty clear that that was the play. So there's a term that you use to describe Blake's output, which included a lot of salon trifles. And I think what that means, and let me attempt to interpret it on my own and then you can help me. I mean, one had this sheet music and one owned a piano so that right. when company was over, you know, once you got tired of talking to one another about stuff, you could play these songs, which were, they, you know, it's not it's not Chopin, it, but it's like something to listen to and something, you right. know, a reasonably proficient piano player can play to entertain guests. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I think a decent analogy here is people who share funny YouTube clips, right? <laughs> so someone comes over to your house and you're just like, hey, have you seen this thing? Or, you know, if it's in a political context, hey, have you seen what, you know, so-and-so said about Trump or so-and-so, you know, whatever. My sense is it's that. Someone goes, you come over to your house, you're playing your standard sort of, you know, whatever the popular songs are at the time. And, oh, hey, did you hear this? I just got this. You know, the pe- impeachment, someone wrote an impeachment polka, let's play that. The experts with whom I spoke, who were spent a lot of time focused on cheap music and or dance, suggested that this was meant to be a dance tune, that it was something that people would get up and polka to. Polka was a very popular dance of the time, very easy to learn, very sort of ecumenical in terms of economic class, that lots of people were sort of into it, regardless of how much money they had. And so this was both smart from the standpoint of making as much money as possible, but also just sort of intended to be sort of a lark. Today, people would perhaps be flossing instead of doing the polka. So yeah, and the other thing that you did, because as I understand it, there is not an easily available recorded version of this. It was sheet music, but maybe not much else. You actually arranged for a Washington Conservatory of Music pianist to perform it for you 
and asked him a little bit about what he heard anywhere in the music as possible subtext. W- what did he say? Yes, Michael Adcock, who's actually a ragtime pianist, and so there's a sort of bounciness to the tune that, that he gave it, which I think is great. He made an interesting point, which is that when you listen to the piece, it starts out with a somewhat somber tone, just sort of a, you know, as though it's building up to this is a thing of import. But then very quickly gets very light and bouncy and and just sort of is fun to listen to. And so while it's not clear what Blake's politics may have been, Boston was at the time probably pretty supportive of impeachment of Johnson just based on how their House members voted. It's not clear where Blake landed on this, but it certainly suggests that he was treating the entire affair with a certain bit of levity. And I think it's also, I mean, if you even think about it, so that impeachment was characterized by a kind of toxicity and an intemperate its speech, both by Johnson and then eventually by Johnson's opponents, that, you know, if it's possible, really exceeds the tenor of our modern political climate. You know, it really it really was very, very heated and, and tensions right. were high. And of course, you're coming out of this terrible war. And so the, I, the idea of getting up and jolly, in, in a very jolly way, dancing around to a song about impeachment is in itself kind of a joke, I would think. Yeah, it's, I mean, to put it in sort of 20th century terms, it does seem a little nihilistic, right? I mean, we've certainly just come out of this. 1868 is literally three years after hundreds of thousands of Americans killed each other, Mm -hmm. right, in this conflict. And the impeachment was, to a large extent, a sort of continuation of the same North-South tension. The South didn't have any, most of the Southern states didn't actually have an ability to vote on the impeachment because they hadn't met the standards required for them to rejoin Congress by that point. Uh, But it still was that same sort of tension manifested in Democrats versus Republicans that was targeted targeting Johnson. So there certainly was an aspect to it which was more profoundly divisive probably than what we experience now, hopefully, than what we experience now. And it may be the case, not to, you know, impute too much into to what Blake's thinking was, but it may be the case that this was light as a response to that tension. That was Philip Bump. A correspondent for the Washington Post. That's our show today. Pardon me. That's our show. It was produced by Betsy Kaplan and Jonathan McPants, hosted by me, Colin McEnroe. If you're listening to this on Connecticut Public Radio, hooray! Then you know that we probably have been bumped out of our regular noon time slot in favor of the actual impeachment trial. We think right now that's what's happening. And so, I don't know, you're probably listening to it on some... I have no idea when you're listening to it. But we will do the best we can to get the word out about when our other segments, our other episodes are going to be on the air going forward. Do I sound confused? It's not my fault for once. A lot of times it's my fault. I don't think it's my fault right now that I'm confused about when my own show is going to go on. Anyway, if you're not listening to this on the radio, if you're listening to it, you know, on a phone, on a podcast, whatever, if you're chained to the floor of a basement with mummy wrappings all over you and you're going to go, and and my voice is coming from somewhere and you're trying to reach to turn off whatever is making the noise. Well, that means that somebody has gotten this from where you get podcasts, you know, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, whatever's happening, I'm really sorry if you're a mummy, but uh, to everybody else, thank you so much for listening. Come back. We'll be on someday, somewhere soon. (laughs) 